Hello, you're listening to Send in the Experts with Georgina Durant. This podcast is all about teaching and supporting children and young people with special educational needs and disabilities, SEND. My name is Georgina Durant. I'm the host of this podcast brought to you by Twinkle SEND. As a former teacher in Senko myself, I wanted to create a platform to share some of the amazing things that my guests are doing to support learners of SEND. So whether you're listening on your commute, tuning in while walking your dog or curled up on the sofa with a nice cup of coffee, thank you so much for joining us. In this episode, I am delighted to be joined by Louise Burton from Speech and Language Link to talk all about DLD. Louise is a highly specialised speech and language therapist who previously worked in the NHS within mainstream and specialist school provisions. She joined Speech and Language Link in 2019, where she leads on their research and evidence base. Speech and Language Link create packages that support schools to identify children with speech language communication needs, or SLCN, and provide universal and targeted intervention alongside training for staff and support for parents. Hi, Louise. How are you? Hi, I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Um, so, could you tell us a little about? Uh, you've sort of we've alluded a little bit to your background, but I'm always curious to know how people get into these things. So, what led you to become a speech and language therapist? Yes, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so my I used to look after my cousins a lot. I was the oldest child in our family, and one of my cousins had um this and really struggled with some of her speech sounds so she ended up having some speech therapy and I used to help her with her reading and her sounds a little bit and then actually one of my granddads um, had a stroke and had speech therapy at home um, and I ended up sitting in on some of his sessions so I don't know if lucky is the right word but I was yeah. able to kind of really experience firsthand the profession and I think for a lot of people it's it's still not really very well known so unless you've got that kind of family link or um you know some or yourself you've had you know support you don't you're not really aware of the the profession that's such a um, good point because you don't see like when you ask kids what they want to be when they're growing up they don't put their hands up and say speech and language therapy because they don't know what it is but I suppose if you've experienced it on a personal level with your family then you would know what it was and you would know it was an option yeah and I think then you've seen as well the impact it can have mm-hmm. as well I think um lots of people view speech therapy as for very specific things as well you know we all think of children who have lisps or children who have stammers and that you know those client groups are really important but there's so much more you know that speech therapists do so I think it's yeah it's for me I was lucky that I had that kind of window into it and yeah it was something then I was interested in and kind of went from there wow so is that is, did you go to university and then straight into speech and language therapy then so it's all you've yeah known. <laughs> yeah I did it is all I've known I know I did start at uni and think oh you know if, if I'm really terrible at this in my placements I don't know what else I'm going to do but <laughs> luckily luckily yeah. I still enjoyed it so yeah it's good oh brilliant so your day-to-day job um so it, yeah what's your day-to-day job like what do you do on it on a day-to-day yeah it's so it's very varied I'd say no day is the same um and yeah like you said I, I lead on our sort of research so um I will run any kind of studies we're doing or trials of our packages um, looking at the effectiveness of them and just really making sure everything we're doing really is evidence-based yeah. so um a big part of my role at the moment really exciting me is that the EEF, the Education Endowment Foundation, are funding a, a large trial of infant language link. Wow. Um, so we're doing that at the moment. So that's just started in um, in schools now. And I'm kind of leading on that sort of from, from our side. So we've done our own studies and, and other agencies have done kind of smaller studies, but it's really great to get a, a large, you know, a large study going in schools to really look at, at look what, it, what it's doing. Um, yeah, so that's a, that's a big part. Um, <laughs> And yeah, training schools. So we do lots of training with our schools using speech and language link um, and supporting them with using the packages. Um, I'm just about to start um, a cohort running through our CPD training. So we do Mm -hmm. a more sort of in-depth CPD training all around SLCN and supporting children in schools. So I'm starting one of those next week. Um, I also work with a psychometrician um, who looks into all of our sort of statistics. So in terms of developing our assessment, a psychometrician. Psychometrician. Um, I've not actually heard yeah. that word before, I'll admit. <laughs> what does it mean? So he really specializes in, yeah, kind of statistics. And um, so all of our packages have a standardized assessment as part of them. So um, we work with him to make sure that they are working in the way that they do and developing the assessments so that they are, yeah, identifying the children that they need to be identifying. So, yeah, I've kind of branched off into kind of a bit of 
maths really yeah. kind of quite difficult maths and statistics which I'm actually finding really interesting oh, so brilliant. yeah yeah. So we, we've previously had a podcast episode on speech language and communication needs in general, and it was such a broad topic that it was a really popular episode, but it was such a broad topic that we couldn't really delve into any sort of particular area because it was just too, it, it, speech language is too big. Isn't it? Um, so one of the areas that a lot of people were saying they wanted to know more about was DLD and there's DLD Awareness Day coming up, um, hopefully on the day that this podcast is coming out. And I believe DLD affects around 7.6% of the population, which it's quite a lot of people considering it's something that most people haven't heard of because I was on the train with my friend the other day and she she knows a lot about special education needs and disabilities and I said to her do you know what DLD is just as research for this podcast just out of interest and she was like what's DLD and I was like that is my point (laughs) yeah it's something and apparently I was reading the other day and correct me if I'm wrong but there are more children with DLD than they think there are autistic children yep which, and more uh, than there are children with dyslexia. Yeah. Wow. So what? tell us what DLD is and the reasons for DLD Awareness Day then. Um, obviously, I think we've alluded to the reason for DLD yes. Awareness Day <laughs> because people don't know what it is. But um, yeah, tell us what DLD is. Yeah, so DLD um, stands for Developmental Language Disorder. So um, children who have DLD have really severe difficulties with language. So understanding language, so understanding words and sentences, but then also using them. So using words, putting them together into the sentences to express themselves. Um, And it's developmental, so it starts in childhood, but it then goes um, it doesn't go away. So it kind of tracks throughout that individual's life. Um, But the difficulties that that person has or the impact of those difficulties might change as they get older. Um, And it's so the the difficulties that they have with language are long term, like I said, and they're really significant. So they have a real functional impact on their life. So they'd really impact on a child's ability to access the curriculum um, to make friends. um, And they'll have that kind of long, long term impact for them on their lives, really. And kind of similarly with autism, which you've mentioned, um, if you had lots of children with DLD, no one of them would be the same as the other, you know. And because language is so complex, there's so many different areas. Children can have kind of strengths and weaknesses in different areas. So, you know, some children might really struggle with grammar, you know, kind of word endings and structuring their sentences, whereas others might really struggle with semantics. So like the meanings of words and how they connect together and others might struggle with kind of processing information and retaining that information. So although the kind of core is that they're, they've they got these severe difficulties with language, they're persisting throughout their life and they really, really have that functional effect on their life. Um, they can be very different in terms of how they present. Yeah, which I suppose makes it even harder for people to work out if somebody has DLD. Yeah, and, and kind of as you said, the reason for DLD Day is that it isn't a condition that's very well known about, despite how common it is. Um, and so we have DLD Day now every year. So it's on the 20th of October this year to really raise the profile of the condition and provide lots of resources, lots of support um, and somewhere for children and families and young people to go, you know, to yeah. to be able to read up about, you know, the difficulties that they have and and to understand it better, really. That's good. Um, and am I right in thinking that previously it was called specific language impairment? Is that right? Yes, yes, that what, is. Why right. was the change? Was it the word impairment that obviously we're moving away from, or what was what was the reasoning? It was more the so the um, it was more the sort of the specific side of it. So okay. yes, so specific language impairment um, was for almost a kind of a smaller group of children. So. Right. Children who have developmental language disorder couldn't have another condition that would also affect their communication. So you couldn't have autism, for example, and DLD. You couldn't have Down syndrome and DLD. But you could have another difficulty that doesn't affect your communication. So you could have, say, ADHD that affects your attention. You could have a motor sort of movement difficulty, or you could have um, a bit of a more learning difficulty, if that makes sense. With the term that we were using before, specific language impairment, it was kind of, as it says on the tin, just completely specific to language. So to get that diagnosis, a child couldn't have any difficulties in any other areas. So they couldn't have attention difficulties or motor difficulties or learning difficulties. And 
that actually is was a really really small number of children yeah. and working as a therapist myself in schools I barely ever was able to use the diagnosis yeah. because I didn't always have enough information about the child's other areas to to actually definitely say that they had it and so then there were huge numbers of children who had these really significant language difficulties that we didn't really have a term for mm -hmm. and across the country we were all using a range of different things so we were saying language impairment language difficulties language delay language disorder you know and it was just really confusing for everyone involved and I think that's part of the reason why it's just not well known about because it was it, it, we were we just weren't really clear in terms of the term yeah and a bit of uncertainty using. and difference in terminology yeah and that makes sense and you said it's lifelong so why is that because when you sit here developmental you almost think okay if it's developmental then surely that means as they get older that it's it's going to be easier for them but it's not is that right no it's not so it is a type of neurodiversity so in a similar way to, to autism or to dyslexia so it's about uh, it's a learning difference for them so the way that they process language the way they learn language is different to to a child who is neurotypical yeah. um so that way of of them learning that process that doesn't change so they are going to have this difficulty you know throughout their lives so it's about having those strategies in place identifying their difficulties and and having that in place for them so they can make you know the progress and that you know that they can yeah and so the number we've been reading lots about the numbers of speech language and communi children with speech language and communication needs increasing is that the same with DLD are you noticing there's more children with DLD or you're identifying more children with DLD that's a really great question as well. Um, and it's it's not really a very clear picture, I would say, at the moment. Yeah. I think it's it's difficult to answer. I would say definitely children with SLCN are increasing. And I think there's kind of different reasons for that. So definitely the, the COVID pandemic had a huge impact on children's language skills. You know, they missed out on so much time, you know, in education and those opportunities, particularly for those transitioning from, you know, preschool into school. Yeah. Um, so for lots of those children, they've missed out on, you know, lots of language enrichment, but they've also not been identified, you know, potentially as having those difficulties. Yeah. So now I think we are seeing more children with those difficulties. Um, and equally, I think you exactly as you've mentioned, we are getting better now at identifying them. So yeah. I, I don't know whether it's that there are more children or there are more children, but also we are getting yeah. better at identifying them. Um and in terms of the numbers of children with DLD, we're kind of relying on the research that we have in terms of the numbers we would expect there to be. Mm -hmm. So until there's kind of more research, we can't really say whether there's definitely, you know, more. But it would make sense to me that some of those children with SLCN whose needs haven't been identified, their language difficulties are likely to have become more severe now. So actually, we may see more children dipping down yeah. and meeting that criteria for that diagnosis of DLD yeah. if that makes sense no it does it makes complete sense so teachers listening and I always think hopefully there's teachers listening there are um if they are thinking right how will I on a day-to-day -day, when I go in tomorrow to my classroom how will I notice if there's a child in there with DLD obviously they can't diagnose but they could identify and be looking out for um signs what are they actually looking for so this is also why it's so difficult and why it's it's just not well known because it's known as a hidden difficulty. It's yeah. it's invisible, really, because you you can't observe a child understanding, you know, all of that goes on in, in our brains. It's not something yeah. you can see. Um, and as I talked about, some children with DLD will have um, lower learning ability, but most children with DLD or quite a large number of children with DLD have normal sort of general learning ability so they're actually very good at masking their difficulties you know they'll be looking at their peers to work out what to do or following clues that the teacher's giving you know gestures and pointing and just using the general routine to really look like they know what they're doing oh, and so, so it they're can not be... the one that's struggling in the class they're not going to be the one that you're obviously seeing who's struggling with with the learning you might quite easily miss them in a sense yeah um for some of them definitely some of them you, you know, you you will notice, but for lots of them, that will be the case. Um, and so actually, it's thinking about if you have a child who is struggling academically, um, if you've got one who's struggling to develop their literacy skills, 
um, any that are struggling in terms of making friendships, you know, um, if they're always getting into conflicts with their peers or misunderstanding, any with challenging behaviour, you know, you can, yeah. uh, you can see if, if you're persistently not really understanding what's happening in the classroom, you know, why would you want to be there? Why would you want to carry on? Um, and so actually they might have really poor attention and focus because, you know, what's the point in trying to listen when you're, you know, you're not getting what's going on really. Um, and those as well that just always seem to get the wrong end of the stick or, or just be doing the wrong thing. And I think it's really easy to think of those children as misbehaving, you know, you'd say to them, right, I want you to go out and get your lunchbox and then come back and sit at your table. And they might just get the lunch thing and get the lunchbox and kind of wander off to the hall. And, you know, you can see how they'd be really kind of mis misinterpreted as, as just kind of doing what they want, really. Yeah, and just not following the full instruction. You can think, oh, you weren't listening properly. Or you can just see yeah. how it would happen, wouldn't you? Oh, mm-hmm. gosh, it's awful. And it, I think because it, like you say, it's not a speech, it's not a speech problem, is it? It's not a problem that you can no. notice. So a lot of a speech language and communication needs, if it's to do with a speech, you might notice a child struggling to speak. It's a lot easier to notice a child, presumably, yes. like with those difficulties, rather than somebody who's just not understanding with a receptive language language skills yeah. not understanding properly what you're saying that oh that's so hard isn't it mm-hmm. it's hard for teaching it's really hard for the, the child as well and their family because there's so many misunderstandings and so much frustration that could build there definitely and so we from our point of view it's all about screening um and we would recommend a whole school screen in reception because wow. really that is the only way that you're going to make sure that you catch everyone yeah, you really. can't rely on individual teachers to be looking out for those subtle no. things can you like yeah no and and you know they will notice things as they get to know their class but like I say some of these children are so good you know they just want to be seen to be doing the right thing they want to be like everyone else and they are just really good at at trying to mask the difficulties they're having yeah Yeah. it wasn't one of my questions that I was going to ask but just thinking are there more boys or girls or is the gender split um yeah so there are there are more boys than girls who have yeah difficulties with SLCN definitely um yeah yeah so if a teacher thinks that they've so they've listened to this <laughs> and they thought right I've listened to Louise and she said that I think so and so in my class might have DLD what do they do so I would say definitely speak to their their Senko and you know find out if there is anything in school that they can use to yep. assess or kind of screen them um but really if they think that their child is that child is really struggling and might have DLD then I think they need to speak to their kind of local speech therapy team yeah. as well and um so the school can make a referral or um you know parents themselves actually can make referrals you know directly as well so okay, yeah brilliant. But I think it's always good, you know, and speech therapy teams will be looking for this as well. You know, what is in place in school already? Yeah. You know, yeah. what screening has been completed, what assessment and actually what interventions are in place, you know, for that for that student. So, yeah. And what sort of things can teachers be doing then if they suspect? Well, I suppose they should be doing anyway, because if they, there are, there are going to be children in their classroom with DLD, aren't they? If, looking at that percentage, the chances are there will be, even if they haven't been identified, chances are there's going to be some children in the class with DLD so what what can they be doing in their classroom to help support these children yeah definitely exactly as you said you know it's, it's one in 14 you yeah. know has DLD so there'll definitely be children in in every classroom um and it like you said it's just about you know day-to-day things that they can be doing and it's it's just those core kind of high quality teaching strategies really yeah. so um so as I said lots of children with DLD can really struggle to retain and, and process that spoken information so breaking things down and really kind of chunking information is really crucial so both in terms of the instructions that you're giving or the the language that you're you're using but also in terms of tasks. So, you know, a, a whole task with all of the steps would be really overwhelming for a child to understand. So kind of really chunking that down, using things like task management boards and planning sheets. So actually it's bite size and manageable and they can do that a bit more sort of independently. Um, explaining things is really important. So really kind of pre-teaching and going over new vocabulary mm-hmm. and children who don't have DLD or don't have language difficulties you know just need to hear a word a few times and hear it in context and they can learn that understand it and they will automatically link it to words that are like it or topics that are kind of linked to it but for children with DLD they they don't automatically do that they don't really have that really good system for learning and remembering vocabulary so 
the, you know, we as, as teachers really need to do that for them. So it's making the links really explicit between that word and other words and topics mm. that they've done previously. So not just assuming, oh, well, this links with this and, and they'll remember that, you know, we did that topic. So that's that kind of prior useful. knowledge. Yeah. And that's going to be useful, not just for the children with DLD in the classroom, though, is it? It's a useful strategy anyway. There's a lot of these yeah. things. And we've spoken in previous podcasts about like strategies for dyslexia, et cetera. It's often the, t- the case is it, it's not going to be detrimental to the other children in the classroom doing no. these anyway. It's quite a, a, a good thing to be doing. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, going Not through that. Cool. And one thing I was thinking, would it be useful? Because I used to be guilty of this, and I probably am with my own children still, giving like lengthy instructions to kids that are a bit too wordy and with words that aren't really necessary in there. Is it yeah. better to be precise with your instructions and clear? Definitely. And it's thinking about there'll be new words that are going to be presented in a topic or in a lesson, but when you're giving an instruction to a child don't use those new unfamiliar words you know and exactly as you said make sure they're nice and simple break them down and that you're asking them to do things in the order that you want them to so it's it's words like oh you know before you get your lunch box I want you to empty your tray you know those things so just asking it out of sequence we're all guilty of doing it as well and you say something and then you you think oh actually I could have said that a bit bit complicated (laughs) I could have said that in a much clearer way. So it's just being aware. And it's things like um, non-literal language as well, you know, sort Mm of idioms, you know, um, pull your socks up and, you know, you're driving me up the wall. Exactly. (laughs) And actually they they did some research and we use those so much of the time. And in teaching, they're used a lot as well. And things like that, 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 you know, children will really struggle with. And like you said, not just children who have DLD, you know. Yeah, so autistic children, idioms can be particularly tricky for. And when you think about them, idioms don't really make much sense anyway. Like the the thought of cats and dogs falling from the sky is absolutely terrifying. (laughs) But we know, we know what they mean. So we just kind of use them without really thinking about it. But they are really, really tricky. Yeah. Yeah. So... We've spoken about what they can do in the classroom. What are the, we've touched a little bit on like behavior and stuff, but what other impacts might there be on children who've got DLD? Perhaps if it's not been identified, what, you know, what apart from the difficulties, I suppose, academically, what other difficulties can it cause? I guess um, it kind of links to academically, but literacy is a big one. So um, children have to be able to understand spoken language before they'll be able to read. Mm -hmm. And they have to be able to use spoken language before they'll be able to write. So we're basically asking them to map random wiggles and squiggles letters onto spoken language. So if children don't have those those oral language skills, they just can't develop their literacy. And I think um, so much of teaching is is focused around literacy. and, And another thing that teachers can do is is put down the pens and do lots more lessons just using oral language because actually that will really boost not just the oral language but the literacy skills as well so you know that that's a big thing and obviously has that academic impact making sure those foundations are actually there before you're building on and it's really it must be really hard because there's there's so much pressure from the curriculum isn't there so much focus at the moment on making sure literacy is yeah is progressing really well but yeah you can't you can't do it until that foundation is actually there no exactly and I think we've talked about behavior and we've talked about friendships but I think a huge thing is that child's kind of emotional well-being as well because they they know that they're different they know that they are not understanding what's going on and they're not getting things like other kids are so that has a huge impact in terms of their self-esteem um and often children will just think that they're really stupid or you know or that they're you know really naughty potentially if they are always being told off for kind of doing the wrong thing so as children get older it's really important that they know what this diagnosis is and know what it means for them um and we'll talk a little bit about it but the DLD day um there's raddled website uh, so r-a-d-l-d and there's lots of videos on there from children and young people who have dld kind of talking about their diagnosis yeah and there are lots of resources out there now for working on children to help them understand this and that is really crucial because like we've said it's going to go on for the rest of their lives so they're the ones that are going to need to take ownership of that and know yeah that helps me if my teacher does this that helps actually if if this happens that doesn't help me I find that really difficult and you know they can take that through life into work you know 
so yeah. you know oh, that's I love really it. yeah that's really good it's really powerful isn't it thinking about it as just a different way of thinking and sort of embracing it and realizing and given that label I know lots of people are concerned about giving children labels but I often think if you don't they're labeling themselves like you said they'll be thinking that why can't I do the same things as my friend I'm not I'm naughty or I'm yeah I hate that word but you know what I mean they're thinking yeah, of all yeah. these, they're labeling themselves with negative <laughs> negative sort of labels and it'd be much better to give give them something to tell them what it actually is. And they're just thinking in a different way. It's just, yeah, yeah, that doesn't yeah, make a lot exactly. of sense. Yeah. And like you say, there are positives and negatives to those labels, but having a this consistent label means that there, there's some way they can go to find out about it, to to meet other people as well who have the yeah. same difficulties. You know, it, it's really empowering. And families as well to understand it and to be able to explain to other family members why, and like grandparents yeah. and aunts and uncles and explain, you know, why they're having these difficulties. And it's not that they're not listening to instructions, it's that they're struggling to understand the instructions, perhaps, etc. So yeah, I can see that being a really good thing. Um, so is there a link between DLD and other types of SCND then? I read something potentially about there being a link with dyslexia, but I wasn't sure if that was correct. So I wanted to check with you. Yeah, so lots of all, all those sort of different types of neurodiversity, there, there's huge co-occurrence between yeah. um, the disorders. And there has been a bit of research looking at DLD and dyslexia, <clears throat> excuse me, and kind of the the summary at the moment is that they do think that they are distinct you know kind of different disorders and it, it comes back really to what we were saying about um different diagnoses you know we need to have a way of labeling these difficulties and they yeah. have to have cut off points but they although they are separate they can frequently co-occur if that makes yeah, sense no, it does. Can and, have both. and even though we're giving these cut off points children aren't to be put in boxes out there but you know they're all no. individuals so it, it, there is going to be overlap and there is going to be differences between yeah. different children so yeah the profiles are going to be different but the the important thing really is kind of on a day-to-day -day basis working with these children children with DLD like I've said are going to really struggle to develop their literacy skills yeah. so actually they're going to need that support for their language but they are going to need support for their literacy as well yeah. and then similarly a child with dyslexia is potentially going to have language needs as well because so much of the language learning that we do happens through reading yeah. you know so much of that vocabulary development and language enrichment so even if a child who has dyslexia doesn't have language difficulties when they start school they might actually have a kind of slower language acquisition yeah. and less kind of breadth and depth of vocabulary um and yeah difficulties with either you know, more kind of complex language because they haven't got that more kind of exposure to language through reading really yeah and I imagine some of the strategies that you're using for children with DLD are going to be useful for children with dyslexia and vice versa as well yes yeah definitely so where can teachers then find extra information and resources to learn about DLD um, to support their learners better then so have you got any recommendations of resources and I can put some of them in the show notes below for people to have a look at but if you could tell us them that would be useful yeah, that would be brilliant. Um, yeah, so I've mentioned Raddled already. I love saying that, Raddled. So it's R-A-D-L-D, yeah. Raising Awareness of Developmental Language Disorder. Raddled. It does um, have, it does roll off the tongue, doesn't it? Raddled. It does, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, that um, is just exactly what it says on the tin. That is um, designed to tell everyone really about DLD and what it is um, and about DLD Awareness Day. So there's loads of videos on there that are really accessible about exactly what DLD is and like I said there's videos of children and young people kind of talking about what it means to them and mm -hmm. just showing it in like you said in a really positive way that this is a learning difference there are difficulties that come along with it but actually this is what I'm doing and this is where I'm kind of striving in life yeah. um, which is just brilliant to see um, and there's loads of resources on there as well so lots for parents and lots for professionals you know in terms of things to to be doing in the classroom strategies to put in place so yeah, that's really great Brilliant. Um, and there's also NAPLIC as well so NAPLIC is an association that often more supports kind of professionals so this would be for school staff but they have a big section on DLD um, and that kind of ranges from you know strategies and resources to looking at kind of the latest research and so you can kind of delve in as as kind of deep as you want to really. 
fabulous and obviously links for your (laughs) yeah 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 so I was just going to mention obviously we we have our speech and language link packages so our language link packages have um, an assessment as part of that so that's completed universally to identify children so it will flag children who are at risk of having DLD that you might want to discuss with the specialist services and then it has those kind of universal interventions so there's classroom strategies we've been talking about but then also more targeted intervention and training for staff so you know really kind of supporting the kind of a whole school approach really to to supporting those children yeah absolutely it sounds like covering all bases there that sounds fantastic is there anything I've missed that you'd like to add and where can people find speech and language links and I'll, we'll obviously put the links in the show notes below on YouTube and on Apple or Spotify or wherever you're listening to the podcast I do have a look at those links but yeah if you could Brilliant. tell us that would be useful yeah. Yes. So if you go to speechandlanguage.info, that's our information website. So that's where there's all the information about our packages, uh, about our CPD training and um, everything that we do for schools. Um, and you can email our help desk, actually, if you are interested in finding out anything. Um, so that's helpdesk at speechlink.co.uk. Oh, fabulous. So when could somebody use that email then? If they were, if they were thinking they've got someone in their class who's got DLD and they just wanted some extra information or what, what would it be useful for? So that would be useful for if someone was interested in um, the packages that we produce, they wanted yeah. to find out more information about those. But then once our schools are subscribing to our packages, that's kind of our help desk. So we have a team of um, XTAs who used to work in schools oh, who brilliant. kind of man our phones and emails. So any question, big or small, from our school. So it could be, I've forgotten my password or I can't log into the website <laughs> to, oh, I've assessed this child and I'm, I'm not really sure what to do. I'm really worried about them. What would you kind of what would you suggest and and our our speech therapy team are kind of in that as well so if it is a more kind of technical question that can come through to us wow it's a brilliant resource fantastic oh well thanks ever so much it's been so lovely to meet you and I feel like we've learned so much about DLD it's been really really useful and I hope everyone who's listening has found it useful too yes I hope so too oh thank you ever so much Uh, She was a fabulous guest. I hope that's helped with raising awareness and understanding of DLD and how to support children with DLD in schools. Do have a look at the resources and links I've popped in the show notes below and check out Speech and Language Link and the work they do via the link below too. Thanks again for listening to Sending the Experts for me, Georgina Durant. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast and please help spread the word about it. See you next time.